קודם כל, בוקר טוב, בחודש טוב, בואו נכניס קצת עברית, אווירת ארץ ישראל. I have to say before I start the share, קודם כל, חזק וברוך to Jesse, not just for this share and this day, but all the Torah that you try to be more bits and לתמוך, ברוך השם. עץ חיים הנה מחזיקים בה, אם ירצה השם יושבים, מחזיק תורה, and מתחזק בתורה. Um, it's a very, very special day for me to be here on many counts. Um, despite how I haven't really slept in a while, I just landed on Friday, I'm leaving right after this year. It's always special to go back to your hometown. This is where I grew up, East 24th and Avenue J. Lech lecha me'artzecha, me'latcha mi'vei tavicha, zachiti lelechet, aval gam yishu lech, t'mit chuzel. Even after Avram leaves, he knows that in Parshat Chayi Sara, it's barur lo, ze ishto shal yitzchak tovo mi molatiti el eretz ha'rtzi. So coming back to the place that you grew up and shared so much with so many people. But it's also special for a different reason, and um, uh, I was hoping that I could see Emily today. Jesse, come in for a second, please. Because I saw that this day's shirim were sponsored by Emily Labaton, um, assuming a memory in part of Rabbi Ezra Labaton. And there's a little secret that many of you in this room probably don't know. He and Rabbi Labaton and I were very, very close. I was a young rabbi in 1990. I just got my smicha from YU, Yeshiva University. And the new synagogue in Deal was opening up, Mega and David. The new, brand new, spanking new synagogue. You could eat off the floors. Today I'm sure you can still eat off the floors, but then you could eat the floors. And we ran a kola. We took about seven or eight boys, and we had a kola for the summer in Deal, New Jersey. And I spent every day teaching Torah, and I had a great opportunity on several Shabbatot to be part of the community. And I was very grateful to him for two things. And I learned a lot from him. Number one, um, I was a young rabbi, and young rabbis don't always receive the type of communal support that they need. Very often they're being dismissed, you should really be a businessman, you should really be a doctor. It's hard when you're growing up and you're young and you're not choosing a profession that provides immediate, immediate communal support. And he was very, very supportive of me. He became a mentor to me. Uh, we didn't have that many interactions but you played a very, very pivotal role in my life, and I try to do the same with a lot of younger Rabbanim. This past Shabbat, I was in Farakaway, and there was a young Rav there, and I pulled him aside, and I told him how wonderful the job he's doing, because he really was, and I gave him some input, and Rabbi Labaton taught me that mentorship. The second part, which is even more germane to being here, is I grew up in Brooklyn in a very, very small Ashkenazi cocoon. What I mean was, it wasn't just Ashkenazi, I was Yeshiva Shashkenazi. I went to Kamenetz in Borough Park. And my community just didn't have the tools to process what was happening in your community because the codes and the packaging were different. So for us, seeing people without a kippah was jarring because in my cultural co codes, that person was not Dati. And seeing people behave on Shabbat differently. And I heard in my community a lot of very negative statements about the community that I'm, Baruch Hashem feels so proud to be aligned with and part of. And by spending that summer in Deal and subsequent time, and I spent several Shabbatot, I went to Ricky Rudy, I spent a Shabbat at his house, and several, they gave me such an appreciation for this community and its differences, and every community makes decisions, and there are no perfect formulas, but certainly the Ahavat Am Yisrael that obviously stretches beyond these little defiles and small little prisons, mind prisons that we sculpt for ourselves are so important. And I really feel a debt of gratitude to him for having liberated me from that cell and from that little small prison hold that my imagination was captured within. So it's very, very special to me to be part of a program that's in his memory. Uh, I don't think about him often because I'm not part of that world, but when I do, I must tell you, I, even now. I certainly shed a tear in my heart. So, Baruch uh, Hashem, thank you for inviting me and. Uh, even if I say nothing else, it's my pleasure to make the trip and to be part of uh, honoring his memory. On that note, um, it's a very interesting geulah. And sometimes this geulah provides more questions than it provides <coughs> answers. And so baffling on so many fronts. Two of the most baffling issues, if this is really Yad Hashem, divine intervention. Number one, why is it so slow and maddeningly, painstakingly convoluted? Our anticipation of redemption is apocalyptic and immediate, a complete overhaul. We delude ourselves into believing that redemption will be an instant and rapid re transformation and re-landscaping of everything we're accustomed to. 
And that's not our topic today. But the other part of our topic today is why is it so secular? And to be honest, most of the Haredi world rejects it for that reason. The hardcore Satmar reject it because of a theological position that man shouldn't initiate Gula, based on the three oaths in Shia Shirei Mishpat Yitchem and Yushalayim, which Chazal interpret as an oath against human initiative. Most of the Haredi world does not subscribe to Satmar. Most of them would claim, if this is Yad Hashem, why is it so secular? Why is it a secular state? Why isn't everyone Dati? Why are the leadership secular? Why is the movement secular? It's a secular national movement. So if we're serious about our identity, not just as Zionists, but religious Zionists, you know, these hyphens sometimes, people think it's a multiple choice. <laughs> when we're modern Orthodox, you can make a choice. You can either be modern or Orthodox. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> either all or nothing. So you want to be a religious Zionist, you can't just be a Zionist. You have to be religious, and a religious person has to be haunted by that specter. So I want to talk about that today, and I want to tackle it from two angles. One angle, I'm going to evade the question. But by evading the question, I'll answer the question. Evasive tactics. Second angle, I'll try to tackle the question itself. Every good rabbi knows how to evade things, so I'm a little bit trained. <laughs> Change the topic. Then maybe I'll circle back to the topic, depending on how much time we have. If we take a look, just one or two snapshots of previous Gula, we realize that there's a trend. There's a theme alert that Gula rarely follows the prepackaged patterns of our imagination. We expect certain trajectories and timelines, and we imagine how Gula will occur. It doesn't always work that way. So let's return to the redemption of all redemptions, the template of all redemptions. Keep in mind, one of the primary differences between Western civilization's view of history and our view of history is that Western civilization views history as evolutionary, open-ended, for us, it's cyclical. We're returning back to the point of origin. We're just retreading past templates that were set for us by our revolt. It's a fundamental difference, and it's absolutely crucial that you process that. We're not looking towards an open-ended evolution. We know the terminus. We don't know the timeline or the trajectory, but we know where we're heading, back to the point of origin. So Yechezkel describes the first Geula, and Jesse kept pushing me, pushing me, such a nudnik. It has to be Tanakh based. It has to, there are things outside of Tanakh, Jesse. It's Torah. So, because I like him, sometimes, I decided to help him out a little bit. And here's your Tanakh uh, moment, your Tanakh um, pitch. You can't just read Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim by reading Sefer Shemot. There are about 10 parallel narratives of Yitziat Mitzrayim throughout Tanakh. And each one of these narratives complements and it fleshes or amplifies certain aspects that are submerged, concealed in Shemot. For whatever reason, there are storylines about Yitzhak Mitzrayim in Yechazkel or in Tehillim or in Hoshea or in Yeshai. Just don't make it into Shemot Vayera Bo B'Shalach. And this is one of them. Not only is it missing, but it's actually a contrast or, an, or a diametrically opposed narrative in Yechazkel. Source number one, when we read Sefer Shemot, the Gula is unilateral. There's no expectation of human initiative. The Jewish people fell silent in Parshat Va'era. And it's understandable why they fell silent because. Am I not speaking loud enough? Should I speak louder? I just want to make sure I get it. Okay, I'm just done. I'm working on very little sleep, so please, I apologize. Great accommodations last night. Nothing to do with the accommodations. <laughs> Something called uh, jet lag. You try to defy the stars and you end up losing. So, descends into history. They also were overwhelmed. The matzah is a symbol of how hurried we were, not just how hurried the Egyptians were. But Yechezkel provides a very, very different story. Source number one, Yechazkel Perachaf. Bayom ahu nasati yedil lehem leotziah meretz Mitzrayim. I decided, Hashem says, Kadosh Baruch Hu, to redeem them. V'omar lehem, ishi kutzei nava shlichu, v'gulei Mitzrayim al titamau. One of the great dangers is that we glorify the past and we mitigate ourselves. We're not midgets and they weren't giants. It's an enfeebling strategy because it acquits us of challenge, because we're so full, and then what does God expect of us? 
Certain areas, our ancestors succeeded. In certain areas, they didn't succeed. My sense is, again, I don't know this community as well, my sense is in the Ashkenazic world, this is a very, very radical problem. Here, less so, but there's a tendency to view yourself as lesser and falling. The Jews in Egypt had lost everything. All of their theology, all of their ritual, they were completely immersed in this culture. Chazal, fill in the blanks, but you don't need Gemara. The Chazal, the Pasi Yamsuf, Halalu of the Abel, Dazara, Halal. You don't, it's in the Pasuk, in Yechazka, Perichaf. And Hashem just desires some human initiative to launch this Gila. So, what's our response? Line number three, Vayamrubi. Four. La Vula Shmoelai. We refuse to listen. Ish Shikutsein Avlo Shlichu. Just a modicum, just a tentative first step. Rabbanu Shalom wants bilateralism, not unilateralism. He wants partners. He wants a human energy to fuel Gi'ula. And he didn't ask us to rebel. He didn't ask us to split the sea, just to walk away from the idols. And we refused. So what was HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan? You'll probably know these words. You say them every night of Pesach. Line number five, number six. Ba'omar l'shpoch chamati alehem. Sound familiar? This line was originally employed as a threat to eliminate the Jews because we didn't deserve to be redeemed. Pesach night, we redirected. Don't You're a good rabbi. <laughs> the evil nations. It's also in Tehillim, by the way, this phrase. So the table is set. Rabbanu Shalom wants our initiative, even a small modicum of imaginative courage. We're just too lazy and indolent, fearful and timid. No. Nope. Rabbanu Shalom decides he's going to destroy us. Start again. Why? Why doesn't he? This is a question that Shemot never evokes. But Yechazkel positions us to. And the answer is crucial, and it's underlined. Line number seven. Vaas laman shemi. Levilti hachel goyim asher hima betocham. For 2,000 years, humanity experienced theological confusion and moral chaos. We read Bereshit and Shemot, it takes us two weeks. You're reading 2,000 years of human history. Avram is born around the year 2000. 2,000 years. Humanity just doesn't get it. They assume there are multiple gods because this world is full of diversity and variety. Dark, light, good, evil, people, soul, consciousness. If there are multiple forces, how can it all stem from one being? It's hard. It's a hard leap of the imagination. But worse, not only did they not, were they not able to consolidate Hashem Echad, they weren't able to conjure an image of a Kadosh Baruch who was moral and compassionate because all they witnessed were expulsions from Eden, population dispersals, floods. They saw anger. They saw punishment. They saw calamity. So they assumed God is angry. They didn't realize God isn't angry. These are the consequences of moral dysfunction. God is Melech Rachaman. Chaim Vachaset. Sim Shalom Tovav Racha. We don't see Kadosh Baruch That's a suicide bomber's view of God. That's why God is happy when innocent people suffer. That's what makes modern Islamic fundamentalism basically atheism. Because if you deny the ways of God, you're denying God. If you speak about a God that doesn't exist, you're an atheist. Even though you present as a monotheist. But you're describing God in ways that are completely, completely inaccurate. You're conjuring up a false idol. Even though you speak in the name of monotheism. And one man, after 2,000 years, was selected, and that man raised a family, and that family became a tribe. And slowly but surely, this process is gaining traction. The ancient world is starting to realize these dual messages of monotheism and morality. And, and remember Parshat Chaye Sarah, how Avram is welcome, the Siya Lukim Atavit Tocheno, they, they're getting it, they get the concept. And Yitzchak and Avimelech and Parshat Toldot are engaging in agreements, and it's not just water rights, these are cultural exchanges. Some of you remember the cultural exchanges between the Soviet Union and the United States and China, how it led to a deeper level of alliance. You start with culture, and culture is how human beings process their identity, and then it spills over to politics and commerce. And, and Yaakov Avina spends 20 years with that sly, swindling fox of a brother and father-in-law, but 
Even Laban is able to see it when he says, So they're getting the concept of Elohim, but there is one culture that remains unrepentant. When Moshe addresses Paro, Shmot, what does Paro say? Me, Hashem, Asher, Shema Bikolo. I have a big, big book of uh, gods. I know Osiris, I know Ra, I know Nile gods, cattle gods. Big index. Google. Google's God. Can't find it. Secular city. Go home tonight and Google convert to those two words. The fourth most popular fill-in will be convert to Judaism. The third most popular fill-in is convert to Christianity. The second most popular fill-in is convert to Islam. You know the most popular completion to that Google? Convert to PDF. (laughs) That's our world. I wish we lived in a world of people struggling for religious values for Christianity. (laughs) They just want to know how to convert it to PDF. They can go back to watching iTunes. So Parah doesn't know. Eliminating the Jewish people at that point of history, though they deserved it, that's Yechezkel's read, would have led to a regression of God's presence in this world. And a regression of God's presence in this world is a chilul Hashem. So Hashem could not tolerate that regression. It would have ruined 400 years of investment down the tube. So Hashem did not redeem us for our deservedness, but for the sake of his name. And you didn't say it today, but you said it eight days ago. We're not here for ourselves. We're his, represent- we're his representatives in this world. Remember I told you I grew up in a very small place here in Brooklyn. And for me, the entire world of Kiddush Hashem and Chilul Hashem was you're going to the Mets game, it was Shea Stadium in those days. Don't act unruly because it will be a Chilul Hashem. <laughs> but if you're nice, it will be a Kiddush, which is true, but it's a lot bigger canvas than just whether schoolboys at Shea Stadium throw popcorn on other spectators. It's where the Jewish people are, what the state of our Jewish nation is. We are his ambassadors in this world. As we rise and as the state of Israel develops, his presence is augmented. Eighty years ago, the single greatest Chilul Hashem since the Churban Beit HaMikdash Sheni was perpetrated. The last 2,000 years, in particular in Ashkenazic lands, but Svartim have had their share as well. Pogroms, inquisitions, crusades, deportations, discrimination, persecution, but nothing, nothing can compare, nothing to the systematic attempt to eliminate anything and everything Jewish, not just in the streets of Europe, but across the globe. Hitler had lists of Jews, which included 200 Albanian Jews. He had blueprints of synagogues in America in his bunker. Jewish blood was cheaper than dogs. And a chilol Hashem of that magnitude required some sort of response. Don't let anyone ever, ever neatly package the Holocaust in any way. The Holocaust is too big, it's too large. The human mind can't process it. If anything, the Holocaust teaches us that we live our, we live our lives with questions. Never lives with questions. There's a rabbi, I've been traveling around the last couple of weeks, so someone asked me about how to uh, respond to homosexuality. So they gave the obvious answer in terms of the person himself, who deserves our embrace and part of the community, but he said, that's not what I mean, Rabbi. How do you solve the riddle if God says this is prohibited and then there are people who feel that it's genetic and how do you? So there's only one answer as far as I'm concerned. There are two poles to this and they conflict and are unwilling to compromise either pole. I'm unwilling to question HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Ratzon. If he says it's Asur, then it's Asur. I can't. I simply can't get past that. HaShamayim Shamayim Hashem, Lo Machshavotai Machshavotechem. On the other hand, I have too much respect for people who feel that they are homosexually inclined based on common science, which at least is what we know now. Maybe today's science is tomorrow's alchemy. But based on current science, it seems as if it's a genetic disposition. I have to respect human beings. Can't say it. Oh, you're just lying. If you say you feel that way from birth, and science has proven that way, how can I be, how can I compromise covered Adam and tell him I'm okay? And I'm unwilling to budge or waver from any of those assumptions. So what's the answer? It's a stir. It's a contradiction. Okay, so I have another question in my life. I don't understand how a kadosh baruch who can make something usher 
if modern science has created genetic predispositions. And again, I'm, I'm not a homosexual, so I can't really live through that trial, but as an outsider to that trial, we don't need all the answers in life. Life's about living with questions and counting questions. We're not going to find all the answers. And if, not that there's one message from the Holocaust, but if there is a message, or one of the messages, but there certainly was a chidol Hashem. Where was God in 1945? And it was such a dark and bleak world. And, and if you compare the presence of a Kadosh Baruch Hu in 2018 to the presence, in, it's incomparable. We live in a world of melochal arts kibodo, because we have our country and our people, and we represent him. And for some people, it just annoys them, it irritates them. And for other people in South Carolina, it excites them. But the Kadosh Baruch Hu has returned to our world. And we lived through Yechezkel Parachaf. I remember living through it about 15 years ago. There was a ceremony commemorating the liberation of Auschwitz. A few weeks earlier, the Israeli Air Force had been invited to participate in war games with the Polish Air Force in a city of Radan. And the squadron commander, who was a Sephardic person and family was not imperiled by the Holocaust, conditioned participation in the war games upon being first granted a flyover Auschwitz during the ceremony. And originally, the Polish parliament was an absolute bedlam. Auschwitz is a cultural, historical site. We can't introduce weapons into this site. But to his credit, he died recently in an accident. To his credit, he was absolutely resolute. Israeli jets will only fly in, Al- in Auschwitz, if they first, in Redon, if they first fly in Auschwitz. And of course, the Polish parliament buckled. I remember it was a September day, and a group of Israeli and Jewish leaders convened on these train tracks that had witnessed such horror. The average lifespan in a death camp, a death camp was 20 minutes. You disembark, you were removed of your spectacles and your glasses, which for people with outside, you realize how discombobulated you become. Your clothes were taken, split from families, your hair was shaven, you're marched naked through a tube, a circular walkway covered on both sides by barbed wire with dogs barking at you on the side. When you saw the gas chambers, you ran, you were freezing cold. You were Tracks that had witnessed such humiliation and dehumanization, Israeli flags were hoisted. Hatikvah was sung, and this squadron commander pulled his team into formation in the skies above Auschwitz and swooped down and announced on his radio, Kicha Chatavor Am Yisrael, one flight for Am Yisrael, Kicha, Kicha is a sortie, Gimel Yudchevei, Kicha Chatavor Eretz Yisrael, Kicha Chatavor Korbanot HaShoah, one flight for Holocaust victims. And it hit me, I said, how desperately in 1944 did we plead with Roosevelt and with Churchill for that one flight? How many bombing missions were conducted over the skies of Europe in World War II? Hundreds of thousands, if not millions. How many bomb, how many tons of dynamite were dropped? Hundreds of millions, without question. In 1944, the skies of Europe were in complete Allied control because the Luftwaffe had been disabled. And all we needed was one bombing mission that could have spared 750,000 Jews who were exported or expelled from the ghetto of Budapest beginning with the spring of 44, because Hungary was the last. And if there are no train tracks, they would have died of typhus and starvation, but not three quarters of a million, 100,000. So three quarters of a million Jewish lives in 1944 aren't worth one single uncontested bombing mission. And I can't imagine a chidol Hashem greater than that. And now we have our Air Force, and we have our flights, and it hit me. I'm living through Yechazkel Perachaf. Ma'as l'man shemi. Did we deserve Gula? Did we not? Secular, not who are our leaders. Herzl, Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion should have been the Chafetz Chaim and ben Yishcha. L'man shemi. History demanded it. We're at a stage of history where Rabbi Hashlam had no choice. Ma'as l'man shemi. L'velti achel d'ayne agoyim. Asheim ma'abitocham. So Gula doesn't always follow our neatly packaged expectations. Even Mitzrayim didn't follow it. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives this lesson twice to us. It appears several times in Tanakh, but I just wanted to highlight to you because there's a lot to speak about today. In Yirmiya, Paraklam at Bet, Yirmiya is standing in the falling and collapsing ruins of Yerushalayim. The Nebuchadnezzar's armies have already invaded. His mercenaries, the ferocious Kasdim, who everyone was terrified of, are now rampaging through town. And that day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants him to deliver a message, not with his tongue, but with his actions. Sometimes Nevi'im are asked to speak. More often, they're asked to act. Role models. So, Kadosh Baruch Hu expects Yirmiya to purchase land in Yerushalayim. And Yirmiya is flabbergasted. He says, Land in Yerushalayim? The Kastim are terrorizing. The city's in ruins. The fires are raging. It's like asking me to purchase land in Fallujah or Mosul. 
there's no market. People will laugh at you. Can I purchase some land, some ISIS enclave? And Yirmiya prefaces his disbelief by reminding Hashem, by the way, don't worry, I'm a Navi. I understand we don't know your ways, and I understand we don't understand your will. I get the concept, I'm a Navi. But this is, this is too difficult even for me to understand. So he says, source number two, Gadal Ha'itzah, line three, pikuchot al kol adam. This is, these are words lifted from Eov. These are classic words from Tanakh, and we don't understand you. Gadal Ha'itzah, the possessor of wisdom, Verava Liliyah, Sheinecha Pekuchot, you see everything. This is the classic way. Hashem and Lokim Atasita, line number two, Tashamayim, Vitaritz, Pekuchot, Gadol, Leipalim, Lecha, Kol Davar, Inesel, Lord, line number five, the ramparts are built. Me'acherev ha'rav ha'dever, and the city is collapsing under the weight of pestilence and sickness and starvation. Ve'ata Marta, line number three from the bottom, K'nei l'cha sadeh b'kesef, you want me to purchase land? This is ridiculous. Zakadosh Baruch Hu responds with one answer. And this becomes, like you have your Gmail password? This becomes the password to enter your Google account. You have to have a Gmail account and a Google account. There's an urban legend that when they were trying to hack into Assad's Gmail a couple years ago, and they had a team of computer scientists and intelligence majors trying to find out what this guy's password is. Evidently, someone on the team looked at someone else and said, wait a second, we're thinking the wrong way. This guy's a moron. We're thinking the other way. Just try one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Evidently, they got to the team. It's too good to be true, but it's a great story. So here's the password for Gula. Hine, Hashem responds to Yermia's disbelief. Hine, last line, source two. Ani, Hashem, Elokei, Kol, Basar. Ha mi meni yi palei kol davar. To you, it looks like pe lamet aleph, pele. Mysterious, unknowable, incomprehensible. Ha mi meni yi palei. Is there such a thing to me that's inscrutable? Human beings process their lives in swaths of 90 years, their historical sweep in swaths of a few hundred years. Rano Shalom scans the millennia. It may seem ridiculous to you, but you see the fires of destruction raging and I see renewal. There's a great um, Ashkenazic Rav, Rabbi Nomer Simcha Cohen of Devinsk, Mesha Chochma. Evidently, around 1900, the Jews of Jerusalem invited him to be the rabbi in Jerusalem, Ashkenazic rabbi. Evidently, I have the letter, not the letter, a copy. The community of Devinsk wrote a letter of outrage to the people of Jerusalem. How dare you invite the great Rabbi Meir Simcha of the great city of Devinsk to some sinkhole in Jerusalem with a few thousand Jews? What are you thinking? Why would anyone want to leave Devinsk to go to Yerushalayim? Can you even find Devinsk on a map? Human beings look at human conventions with fear and trembling. They seem so powerful and overwhelming. It's all just paper tigers. Do you see paper tigers in the world seeds, indomitable forces? That's who we are. We see through it. We saw through the Soviet Union. We see through terror. We saw through Nebuchadnezzar. Our values are too eternal to be overwhelmed by these temporary, <laughs> fearsome agents. They come and they go, they grab headlines, and they disappear into the dustbin of history. But we're here, and our values are here, and our keshe with HaKadosh Baruch Hu is here. Thank God I'm retired from interviewing students. That was the worst part of my career. <laughs> I'd rather go to Siberia. <laughs> but I used to interview students. And one of the questions I would ask them is, if you could climb into a time machine and visit one part of Jewish history, what part would you visit? Because I don't just want to know how religious they are. I want to know who they are as a Jew. So much of who you are is not just how tefillin and matzah and tarat and mishpacha and shabbat, but are you a proud Jew? Sometimes I'll perform a mental experiment with my class and I say, close your eyes and tell me the best Jew you've ever met or read about. But one caveat, they can't be religious. Who's the best non-religious Jew you've ever met? Because they exist. And that contrast, because they're not religious, but they're so Jewish, helps you appreciate there's something else there. It's not just the ritual and the buildings. There's you know, a lot of religious Jews who just aren't good Jews. There are a lot of non-religious Jews whose Judaism is just such a fiery burst within. And they just To me, the answer is obvious, Menachem Begin. I wish I could be half the Jew he was. 
But sometimes I'll ask them, if you could climb one back, one point in Jewish history, where would you go? So I get the classic answers, Kriyat Yamsov, Matan Torah, the State of Israel. About 15 years ago, I'm interviewing, and the boy says, Rabbi, where would you go to? So first of all, I put a big check. I said, this is a boy I want. He's got moxie. He's got chutzpah. You can't, you can't get anywhere in life without chutzpah, Jewish chutzpah. I said, where would I go? I said, I would go back to Auschwitz, 1945, and walk out with the survivors. Because what was the first thing they did? They found a niece from their shtetl, or a cousin of a friend, or a sister of a brother, or something. Got remarried, built new families, named after the people who they'd lost. 2020 hindsight teaches us that those children born in 1946 and 47 would march in the fields of Gula two years later. What's three years in the span of history? It's a hiccup. But they didn't know that. And what type of moral courage must it have taken to bring children into such a nightmarish world? But it just reminds us sometimes you just have to do what's right and toe the line and leave the calculus to Akadosh Baruch You can't always calculate. You have to have the moral courage just to hold the line and do what you think is right, what Akadosh Baruch Hu expects of you, and he'll work out the calculus. Trust him, he'll find a way for it to all. Sometimes we're just too. There's a great line, since, since you taught me so much about your community, I'll teach you a little bit of my community. It's a great line, it's called Oiske Cheshben. Timedai mitchashben, kol azman. All the way, too many cheshbonot, Oiske Cheshben. Anytime an Ashkenazi does something a little too much, you put the word Ois, and then you put Oiske Shlafen, Oiske Cheshben, Oiske Cheshben. Too much, too much cheshbonot. So Yermia is baffled, and Hashem says, why are you baffled? Last line, source two. How many ye palei called avar? Nothing to me. And Yirmiya reminds us, and this is, the first, this is the conclusion of the first part of this year, that we are unable to understand Gula, and it doesn't neatly package itself to our expectations and accommodations, and it's not some clearly predictable sign curve whose rises and drops we can predict and understand. It's precisely the irrationality of Geula that renders it redemptive. Because we try to redeem our world as best we can through human efforts, and when we can, HaKadosh Baruch Hu steps in and redeems it in ways that we can't beyond human ability and beyond human comprehension. It's precisely the irrationality and unpredictability of Geula that renders it redemptive. And that's why so many people have a difficult time with it, because Halakha is, is rational, it's mapped. How black should my tefillin be? How much matzah should I eat? How much mortar in the mikvah? How much it's... Siman Aleph, Siv Aleph. Siman Aleph, Siv Bet. It's just rational, and we're all really good at the rashi. But Gula is anti-rational. It's lyrical. It's, it's in your neshama. It's, you have to have a sense of who you are as a Yehudi, as a Jew, where you've been, where, where we've marched, what we've struggled. It's, 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 it's listening to a song almost. It's a song of Shir Shirim. It's not... Rational. You can't put your finger. How do you know that it's go? You just know it because you're a Yehudi and you know what we've been through. And there's an old story about an old man in the shtetl named Mendela, whose job it was to wake up everyone. Well, let's change it because it's Slichot of El. It's the original story. So his name is Chaim. And his job is to wake everyone up for the Slichot of Chodesh Elul. All the, every all month long, he's waking people up. And finally, Erev Rosh Hashanah comes, and the Slichot of Erev Rush and Chaim is. Sleeping, he can't keep his head up. So everyone starts taking their papers and tossing it at Chaya to hit him in the head. And he starts crying. He says, "I'm so tired. Just let me sleep." They all look at him and say, "Chaya, you kept us awake the whole Chodesh Elul. You didn't let us sleep the whole Chodesh Elul. You think we're going to let you sleep now? What do you think? You've been waking us up for a month. We're the Chaya of, of humanity. We've kept the world awake for two thousand years." We didn't let them believe in multiple gods, even though they threw us to lions. We didn't let them believe that God had a child, even though they trampled us in France. We didn't let them believe that God was angry, even though they pursued us in Algeria. We demanded that the world see him as moral. We demanded that the world see him as one, even though we're being persecuted and downtrodden and beaten back. And now all we want to do is go, go to sleep. It's Arab Rosh Hashanah. We want to go back to Israel and go to sleep. We'll say, ah, I... You kept us awake for thousands of years. You think we're going to let you sleep now in Eretz Yisrael? They're throwing their missiles at us and their stones and their tires. And it's because we've been the world's alarm clock. And this message HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Yirmiyah, he also gave to Zechariah. 
it's a pella. This is a more familiar nivuah. Yesh v'zekinim v'zekinot b'rechavot Yishalayim sorts three. Vish mishatel b'yadav v'rav yamav. R'chavot ha'im alo yiladim yiladam m'sachkim r'chavot ha'a. Very, very famous nivuah. We all know about it. Children frolicking in the streets of Jerusalem. Old men and women leisurely stroll summer afternoons on Ocean Parkway in Israel with their canes. But look at how the Nevoah ends. That we don't often read. Source number three, those who will remain to witness these scenes will be shocked. See that word, Yipale? They'll be shocked. And here, in one of the greatest hyperboles, in full of Tanakh, Hashem says, I'll also be shocked. It's so shocking. These are natural pastoral scenes you can witness in any country in the world. Children playing in the streets, old men and women carrying canes. But what's natural for every single nation is apocalyptic for Jews because we don't function under the rules and guidelines of history. In Finland, this isn't a prophecy, it's just normalcy. In Sweden, it happens on a day to day occurrence. But how long have we waited for children to frolic freely in streets? And we're still not there in Ashdo, in Tivolt, and in Ofakim, and in Kiryat Shmona, and in... And how long have we waited for people to be old enough and not to be murdered before they reach the age of 60 and 70 and actually need canes? They never reach it, we never saw them. Just think of yourself, again, I'm an Ashkenazi, I, I, I have a family. My Seder table was my parents and my grandparents. Everyone else wasn't there. Not them, not their canes. I didn't even see the canes. I didn't see anything. They didn't live, they didn't live long enough to have canes or walking sticks. My Rebbe Rav Amital, great, great man. Great, great. There's, there's a biography about him. He's basically the father of the Hesder movement. He told me that when he escaped the Holocaust, he learned in yeshiva called Hebron in Givat Mordechai. He would walk every day to yeshiva, and he would stop by the playground and look at the children playing. And he became transfixed, and he couldn't move, and he started crying, and he stayed there for hours, just crying and crying, because he thought he was living through Zechariah. Next time you're in Israel, you see children playing. Next time you're in Israel, you're trying to take a Shabbat afternoon nap, and the children are playing and bothering you. <laughs> There's a price for prophecy. Small price to fit. You miss an afternoon Shabbat nap. I think your grandparents had to deal with a little bit worse. <laughs> and Hashem reminds Zechariah, as he told Yermia, that Geula will never be Moshe, the Aaron, the Chonav, Ushmuel, the Koresh, Mo, and Anak, a vote. It's a naivete to believe that that's how Geula will unfold. The Geula, Sadiqim will come, Chabetz Chaim, and the Ravadja, and then the Goran. It's packaged differently, its pace is erratic, its unfurling is unpredictable. It's a gula. It's a different world, yes. If I understand you, when we talk about rationality, we are not supposed to draw any conclusion from the fact that this is how it unfolds. Absolutely not. It's devoid of meaning. It's not that it's contrary. Right. And in the, and the next five minutes, I'll give you an answer. <laughs> My first chair is, I don't know, and we shouldn't expect to know, but I think I do know. I contradict myself. And there are several other instances in Tanakh. I could only highlight two or three. Yechezkel, Perachaf, Yitzhak, Mitzrayim. Many, many, many other instances. But in the 10 or 15 minutes we still have remaining, let me reverse my tracks and tell you why I believe secular Zionism is not a tragedy, but a divine interdiction. Let me tell you a story. Um, three weeks ago, I was in South Africa for a conference called the Sinai Indaba. Indaba in Africa means gathering. So they got together, people from all over South Africa, and they invited speakers from all over the world. There were about 5,000 people. It was very impressive. It's a very tight-knit community. But seven years ago, I participated in the first Indaba. That was the first six years ago, seven. So they had a conversation, a panel discussion between myself and Jonathan Rosenblum. Jonathan Rosenblum is a correspondent for the Jerusalem Post who covers the Haredi world. And he and I were meant to debate the Haredi versus Dati Lumi, and the chief rabbi Goldstein was the uh, moderator. 
I forgot who spoke first, but he spoke 20 minutes about how wonderful the Dati Lumi community is. And I spoke 20 minutes about how wonderful the Haredi community was. <laughs> At some point, Rabbi Goldstein said, we didn't fly you all the way out here to South Africa to love one another, start fighting. So I'm not very good at bickering, not one of my strong points. So he articulated the Haredi position, more or less. Well, I can't do it justice, he's not here, but more or less his position was that in 1800, every single Ashkenazic Jew is Dati. And in 2000, only a small fraction. What has supplanted religion in the imagination of these Jews? Secular nationalism. So it must be idolatrous because anything that replaces religion is paganistic and idolatrous and therefore has to be rejected. More or less his position. So I responded as follows, and again, this is an Ashkenazic discussion. I'm sure it can be extrapolated in many, many, many different ways. And I'll refer to them a bit later. 19th century was one of the most catastrophic centuries for organized religion. After a thousand years of feudalism, humanity at large experienced the renaissance of spirit, age of reason, age of science, appreciation of art. That then yielded political freedom, economic freedom, the great process, the 18th century, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Thomas Hobbes, leading to bullets in Foxborough and guillotines in Paris. But either way, the new era had arrived. And man began to think retrospectively what caused all this suffering and hardship for thousands of years. And he identified organized religion as the primary culprit of human suffering. This unholy alliance between religion and state, the Crusades, the Holy Wars, the subjugation, the caste system. And like dominoes, organized religion across the world began to crumble. Christianity, Islam organized religion. Now there's an old expression that nature abhors a vacuum. But not only does nature abhor a vacuum, human identity abhors a vacuum as well. And now that human identity was no longer pivoted on religion, people were searching for some other ideology to provide identity. That's why the 19th century is the great age of ideology, Marxism, capitalism, utilitarianism, socialism. People are searching, what, what defines me? What am I defined as? But what was the most powerful ideology of the 19th century, nationalism. People started to identify not based on religion, based on national ethnic allegiance. So in the 16th century, John would introduce himself, my name is John and I'm a Protestant and I live in London. And Francois would approach you and say, my name is Francois and I'm a Catholic and I live in France. Now it's 1870 and they introduce themselves completely differently. Hi, my name is Francois, I'm a Frenchman, I have to be Catholic. And I'm John, I'm an Englishman happen to be Protestant. And these national energies are simmering beneath the surface for 50, 60 years and the great eruption into the war of nationalism, World War I, to re-landscape the European map along national lines, not along ancient monarchs. That's the great age of nationalism. Now, don't think that Judaism was immune to this process. I mentioned before the, the great danger of glorification so in the Ashkenazi world, they speak about the great yeshiva world, this yeshiva, that yeshiva, this yeshiva. How many boys do you think attended all the yeshivas cumulatively in the Ashkenazic world in Eastern Europe? Take a guess. 5,000, possibly 6,000. For every one, there were nine who were off the derrick. For every one, there were nine who were leaving. And this, uh, this is a different conversation. I'd be happy to speak about it sometimes. The Sephardic world didn't experience that same burst of the yeshiva world, for better and for worse. The yeshiva world provided a lot of energy, but a lot of polarity and a lot of exclusion. So there's a burst, but there's also an exclusiveness and, and, and many, many levels. Either way, there were millions and millions of Jews slated for historical oblivion. Slated for historical oblivion in the 19th century, and religion was no longer popular in the human imagination to tempt them and hold them in court. Because this was an age in which religion was debunked. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu drew an ancient card from his pocket. HaKadosh Baruch Hu programmed the Jewish heart, and this is the thesis, with the ability to respond to land, nation, and history, even independent of ritual and Torah study. There's something about a Jewish heart that responds to who we are, what our land is, what our collective history is, even when it doesn't respond to kashrut and shabbat and tarat mishpacha and yamaki. There's something Hashem programmed in the Jewish heart. Who was the first Zionist? Who was the first person to migrate to Israel? 
you don't say? And the answer would be source number seven. Vayikach terach et Avram beno, vit lot ben Haran ben beno, vit sarai kalato, eshet Avram. Who migrates first? Terach. Who is Terach? Mitchila of the Avodah Zara Hayu Avotenu. Terach Avi Avraham Pasukin Yahushua. The first man to feel drawn to Eretz Yisrael, as we would say in Brooklyn, isn't just the user, he's a pusher. <laughs> he not just worship idols, he sells them. I grew up in Brooklyn. This is my Brooklyn side coming. He sold idols. He's not just a paganist. He's the grand chief in the paganism. He's not traveling to Israel for his year in yeshiva, for his gap year, to learn another tosvot. He's traveling to Israel because he feels drawn something deep. And that's Yad Hashem. Hashem program. And you've met those Jews when you go to Israel. And you get into a taxi cab driver, and he knows Tanakh much better than anyone in this room. But he's not Dati in the classic sense. Or the falafel store salesman with the picture of the Baba Sali and the Lababacher Rebbe. Just these, they're so deep-hearted Jews. And I live in Alon Shavuot. I know why I live in Alon Shavuot. Sam so, I mean, tell you, it's a nice place to live, but there are challenges and frustrations. And I'm not looking for convenience. I'm not looking for comfort. I'm looking for prophecy. And I'm willing to pay whatever price it is to live a prophetic life because I think Hashem wants us to live there and to advance our land. So if it's a little more difficult, it doesn't matter. But when I see Israelis, secular Israelis who still live in Israel, those who aren't selling creams in your malls, but those who are still actually in Israel, I ask myself, why does a secular Israeli continue to live in this country with all the challenge and serving in the army and beating himself? Why? I don't see secular Zionism as a historical miscarriage. I see it as a Devar Hashem, as Yad Hashem, it's Hashem's koch. Hashem creates this pull, this draw that a Jew, age, dawn of time, Something that makes a Yehud drawn, a Jew drawn to his people, his land, his background. And that's how I answered Jonathan at this in Daba. And it's a pasok in Bechokotai. Hashem Bechokotai after the first Tochacha, which is more or less a narrative of the first Galut Bavel. Hashem says, source number four, V'sacharti et briti Yaakov, Evet briti Yitzchak, Evet briti Avraham Eskor, I will remember the Britot I had with Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov and for people that still live that type of lifestyle and affirm and, re, and, and uh, reinforce, they are beneficiaries of the Brit. But what about people for whom Brit Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov is no longer relevant? Their lives no longer resemble the Brit Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. How will they be redeemed? Where will they? How will they return? But so gets. They are at this score. Even if you're not part of the Brit Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, in the complete sense. Remember, this pasok can't be said in Shemot because Shemot is talking to a group of people who have yet to live in Israel. So in Shemot, Hashem remembers Brit Avot. But now it's B'chol Kotai. And it's a narrative about the Galut after living in Israel. So there's this added, V'aretz Eskor. I will remember the fact that you were committed to land even though you weren't committed to Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And that's how I understand secular Zionism not as a detour or catastrophe, but Yad Hashem. Haaretz Eskar. Hashem creates this magic. I mean, how many Jews today are part of our history solely because of Israel? The ritual doesn't speak to them. The traditions don't speak to them, but just they land on that plane and it's lightning in a bottle. And that's Yad Hashem. And he can't personified. Baruch. You know who personified it more? I'm trying to tell you who personified it more, in my opinion. Who personified it more? Ilan Ramona, Lava Shalom. Why am I saying Ilan Ramona, Lava Shalom, about a Jew who probably never kept halacha in the way that we? Because when he flew, he flew with a flag of Israel on his lapel during a period that was very, very unpopular to be associated with the intifada of the early twos. When he flew, he flew with a Kiddush cup. And he made Kiddush and Shemayim because he knew he flew on behalf of Jewish history. And when he flew, he flew with kosher food. He demanded kasher because he knew he was flying not as Ilan Ramon, but as an emissary of Jewish history. And when he flew, he flew with lists of Holocaust victims. And for the first time in 3,000 years, 
since a Sefer Torah was delivered from Shemayim, a Sefer Torah was returned to Shemayim. He flew with a Sefer Torah. And just like it was delivered with fire, it was returned to fire. Just as it was given in Har Sinai with Esh, Anan Ve'esh. And if not for secular Zionism, it would not have been Ilan Ramon on that shuttle. You know who it would have been? Alan Robinson. Some person who was once Jewish, but now is far, far assimilated, changed his name, he's no longer Ilan, he's Alan. He has a picture of some ancient Jewish grandmother on his wall, but it's irrelevant. But it wasn't Alan Robinson. It was Ilan Ramon. And that, to me, is the divine power of secular Zionism. And the truth is, I'm not saying this in a psychophantic fashion, the Sephardic community gets it better. You understand this a lot more deeply than we do. Because there's a communal integration that you still have that we don't. The Ashkenazim have been doing exclusion for too long. We built fortresses with big moats and us's and them's. And again, I'm not in any way celebrating or supporting one or the other. You pay prices. There are great prices for communal inclusion. I'm sure you know it better than I do. There are great prices for communal exclusion. But to live in Israel and to feel that sense of Yad Hashem, people who are committed to our land and our people. And so we can't understand every single detail of Geula. And it's a Pela. And even Mitzrayim, which is the classic template, we didn't deserve to be redeemed. Ba'as Laman Shemi. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu twice reminded, once Yirmiya, once Zechariya, Hamimene Yipalei Kal Davar, Gambe Na Yipalei Nom Hashem, he told Zechariya. It's about a song. It's about, I don't, have, I don't have that much time we have to end for the next year. That's why Shir Hashirim is so important. I'll end with a little secret. Secrets are always exciting. I went to school, not far from here, but very far from here. It was a place called Kamenetz Yeshiva. It used to be in Borough Park. And then I decided this was not the world that fit me. So I moved to this world, our world. But I'm always and was always haunted by the fact that there's something very special about being insular and protected. We live lives of exposure and encounter and sophistication and filtration. And we pay a heavy price. How many images have your eyes seen that you wish you hadn't? How many ideas have your ears listened to that you wish you could vacate from your mind? And we can't. Price. But there's a kedusha that's protected, kodesh hakadoshim, in no way tainted. And I always ask myself, where's my kedusha? Like, I'm not in that world. Where do I get kedusha from? And my answer always is and was, and this is why I moved over in that world. There's a kedusha to Am Yisrael, and the more that I'm part of Am Yisrael, that's mekor kedushati. Ayudia Pashut, Moshen Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Italia, Algeria, Roma. And we'll end just because I like it. No, it's because I like Jesse so much. I'll end. Shir Ashir, and you asked me. There's a great debate sometimes. There's a, there's a great debate in the Beit Midrash about which book should be canonized as part of Tanakh. Should Kohelet be in because it's so theologically provocative? Should Esther be in because it was written in Chutz Laaretz? Should Shia Shirim be in because it's so racy? Rabbi Akiva, Isha Chazon, Nechnas, Omar, just to finish up, he says, source number 11, Amr Rabbi Akiva, Mishnah B'yadayim, Chas V'Shalom, Lo Nechlak Adam Yisrael, Al Shia Shirim, She'ein Kol Olam Kulo Kedai, Ki Yom Shenitan Ba'o Shia Shirim L'Yisrael, it's the greatest day in history. Then he said, Kol K'tuvim Kodesh, Shia Shirim, Kodesh Kodeshim. Where is the Kedusha? Because Shir Hashirim describes Chaim waking the world up throughout history and suffering for it. We're the Chaim. Describes who we are as a people. We loved Hashem. He loved us. Quite frankly, we blew it. <laughs> this wasn't supposed to happen. The original plan to leave Mitzrayim to Tvav Nisan, receive the Torah of Sivan. It takes 11 days to walk to Israel from Har Sinai. Defeat the pagan kings over the summer pretty much build the Beit HaMikdash by Rosh Hashanah and then history. <laughs> history is meant to be 2,448 years. That's it. No Rome, no Egypt, no Yemen, no Spain, no France, no Poland, no Siberia, no Russia, no Brooklyn, no 
Syria, not, it was, it's all one detour, it's all one mirage. It be part of it, because that's what a Jew is. We don't flee reality. We embrace it and try to change it. Every once in a while, to remember, this is all a detour. One long detour. And Shir Hashem describes, we're looking for him, he's looking for us. Sometimes we open the door, sometimes we don't open the door. Open the door for me. Or sometimes we're so tired. I don't want to get up. That's the Kedusha. And I felt that in, in that world that I was part of, there was too much of a blockade of you know, who the right people are, who the wrong people are. In Yiddish, they said the words Oisvarf. If you're a reject, you're an Oisvarf. You don't keep this inside. It wasn't for me. I felt like I had to be betoch amen and be able to draw from that Kiddushah, the Kiddushah of Am Yisrael. So this is the week. This is our week. My challenge to everyone, to myself, is to be a better Jew by Friday. A better Jew by thinking one Yom Revi about Jews that we've lost, dedicated our, their lives to our people and our land. The schut to be at their graves, how many Jews lost their lives over the last 2,000 years and don't have graves. So at least we can stand by people's graves and honor them and honor their memory. How many Jews lost their lives over the last 2,000 years without purpose? Not this, there's always purpose, but without a palpable purpose. And every single one of these soldiers and people built our land for us. And then on Yom Chamishi, Zia Yom Masa Hashem, Nagilav and Yitzim Chavo, Me'it Hashem, Haitan Zalti Niflot. Now you know what Niflot means. Niflot is a password for Gula. Gam Beinah Yipalei. I mean, many Yipalei Kol Davar. Everyone should have a wonderful week. Thank you again to Jesse for inviting me. Thank you for the coffee.